All right, we're welcome. We're all of you here. Glad you're here. You're going to see us turn out. We'll do some announcements just a little bit. But if you would, let's stand together. We'll say a little chorus that you know. Says, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Stand with me if you would, please. Huh? Oh. But it's good to see everybody here. We're glad you're here. Doug, you and Cindy. See, good to see y'all. Hi, Hi. And uh, good turnout today. Glad to see everyone. And uh, we're going to uh, hear some good singing today. The, the girls have some singing. They're going to be doing for you, of course, Vince's message. Oh, you're all right. But for the record, I didn't pick the songs. They did. This is not my doing. We, we can go out and call you into it. It's not wrong. Take that number to the home. There you go. And for our, for Megan, I guess you're running the words. We're going to be doing the first and last verse of uh, Standing on the Promises here just a little bit also.
Let's talk about a few announcements. Next Sunday morning, Sunday school. We'll uh, start up again. That's a week early, or maybe two weeks early. But uh, that's the what we had previously announced. And then the board will meet on the 12th, and we'll go from there. But Sunday school will be starting again. Next Sunday morning, go to town at 9.30, as normal. And then, of course, our morning worship service, that, that still will take place here in the Family Life Center, at least on through uh, September 12th. Um, ladies Bible Study Tuesday, prayer meeting Wednesday. Let me move to Saturday. You're invited to the Nashville Town Picnic that still is on tap. Uh, we feel like the weather is going to be clearing out by Friday. And things should be fine. Keep that in mind. Meal at five. And if you'd like to bring a covered dish or a dessert, you're welcome to do that. There will be plenty of food there regardless of that, though. Uh, with, with regard to, I can tell you, it's going to be baked beans, macaroni and cheese, pulled pork, and maybe some fried chicken for sure. And then, of course, drinks will be provided and bread as well. You're welcome to come. Singing starts at six. Our special guests this year are going to be these three right here. And we're looking forward to it. And uh, so come and be with us. Also, some fireworks that night, I believe, as the uh, darkness approaches. So keep that in mind. Of course, homecoming is right around the corner. I believe, if my calculations are correct, homecoming is two weeks away. And our speaker that morning will be Reverend Doug Moore. And uh, and I, I, don't, I believe the meal is still not is the meal still not taking place. No meal. Okay, but we are having homecoming. Keep that in mind. All right. Any garden circles coming up? Well, that's, in, that's, that's not until September the 21st. Uh, but keep that in mind. And um, also, this year, don't forget, as part of our homecoming service, there will be a memorial service as well. And so keep that in mind. That's all the announcements that I need to make at this time. Family camp. We'll get about family camp and prayer for that. That is planned for October 8th to 11th at Camp Kodak. Are there any other um, announcements other than some other ones at the bulletin? Are there any other announcements that anybody wants me to make? I've got one. All right. Uh, Wayne had his surgery. He came through it. There's no cancer. They don't believe there is now. They've removed all of it. He's doing well. He's got some pain, but he's recovering very well. All right, I'm sorry. Did you say that, that it came back benign? I, I didn't hear no, that. No, no. They removed the cancer. Oh, okay, okay. All right, okay. Wonderful praise. That's an answer prayer, people. Answer prayer. That's good. Anybody else? I think now would probably be a good time to take some prayer requests. Yeah. So let's leave it. Of course, Wayne would be there. Yeah, Joey.
Anyone else? Pray for Bob Fish. Bob? Okay, yeah, he's been in our, in our prayer um, list here lately. And of course, a lot of names on them, still some names on the back of the book as well. Any others? Unspoken. Unspoken? Anybody? All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you hear our prayer. Lord, we're, we're thankful for answered prayer. And we see answered prayer set here in this church. Every time we walk in it, we see it. God, you answered prayer again by those who, who we've been praying for. And Father, there's still those who pray. And Lord, you heard every name mentioned. I'm not trying to recall every name. God, you heard every one of them. I will, Lord, ask you to be so close to dream of. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, touch Butch. I pray, Lord, that he, is, that he is comfortable. I pray, Lord, that you would work your will in his life. Whatever, Lord, that may be. We give that to you, and we pray for them. And many others, uh, Lord, that have been mentioned here today, Lord, we give them to you too. In faith believing that you hear our prayer, and we know that you do. We thank you for it. Lord, I pray again for the service and his families and women, uh, all that, that are still in harm's way. Lord, I pray that you will be with them. And I pray, Lord, that we give our military leaders and those who do lead on behalf of our nation with them. God, they need those things so bad. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with them. Lord, we give you ourselves. We thank you for the help and strength that you have given us that allows us to be here today and to worship in freedom, Father, that we take for granted so much. Bless the girls now as they bring a couple of songs as we praise and worship you and be with Vince as he brings the message today. God, we give you all. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
is bigger, that is greater and stronger and mightier and more merciful than anything else in this world. I am so glad that I serve a God who is willing to come alongside me in the moments when it's easy, in the moments when it's hard, in the moments when I doubt him. He's always right there. And it's by the power of his Holy Spirit that we can accomplish anything in this world. Otherwise, we'd be lost. Holy Spirit.
please be seated at this time. I'm going to ask the kiddos to come on up here. And Miss Jolene. Oh, man. 
I didn't look 46. So I'm like, hey, so you all here. <laughs> um, I don't have that power. But, but he actually talked to me. And he's finally, he's a, a fantastic artist. So I'm hoping that he has a big year this year. Not just because he told me I'm a gentleman in 46, but because I hope that he is okay here in Alameda County. He did tell me his bike was stolen the first week they moved here. So he's not having a very good year so far. So I'm hoping that things go better for him. And I'm hoping things go better for you this year too. All right? And remember, when you're in the middle of things and it looks like chaos, then God's really orchestrating something. We just have to wait for the symphony, right? And if you get out of line, you get out of step, who do we need to get back with, Meredith? Right, God. We need to get back with the heartbeat. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these little folks here and even the ones that are thirsty. We're thankful that a lot of times when our world looks like chaos, that you were there and you can see the big picture. You see the symphony that you're orchestrating. We know the beautiful music that you provide for us. We don't always understand your plans, but we know they're good and we know they work out for good for those that love you and serve you. We're asking that you bless this school year for these young folks that are up front and the ones at their seat and just help us to to glorify you in each and every day. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm not here next week. service. Um, the, the, there's a plan tonight to record the evening service, his message, just like we do now. And so I just want to pass that along to you. If you're unable to be here for the evening service, and search for it and listen to it. Uh, our pastor is really going on some, on, I mean, some wonderful messages in the evening services on prophecy and the scriptures and he is all over the place with regard to scriptures and, and tying it all together. That and guy's it's, all it's, over the place. <laughs> but it's, it's quite amazing. And those who have been here will tell you the same thing. Now, we want you to come. We want you to be here. I've got to listen to it later tonight or tomorrow. Brenda and I will be out of town starting this evening. And, but I did. So last Sunday I mentioned it. And uh, so there's an effort going to be not, not just today or tonight, but for future Sundays as well to record the evening service. That's the plan. Anyway, so I just wanted to pass that along. All right. You. Thank you, sir. Am I on? Does it sound like I'm on? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. We are still in the Gospel of John, Chapter 1. It probably will be for a little bit longer. It's a very deep chapter, so it's a very long chapter to preach through. Uh, and today we're only looking at one uh, or two verses, verses 35 and 36. And then we will be going somewhere else. So if you go there, the Gospel of John, Chapter 1. Verses 35 through 36. Hear the word of God. It says, And again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Let's pray. Lord, as always, I come before you in weakness. And as always, I, I ask that you would give me a clear mind and even an eloquent tongue. But I pray even more than that, Lord, that no matter what happens, you would take things from your word and you would deposit them in every heart and mind in this room, including my own, and bring forth fruit from what you plant even years from now, long after we've forgotten where we heard it. And I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You will find, if I am with you for a good long time, that uh, 60s television ruined my brain. I will use a lot of analogies involving 1960s sitcoms, and today is no different. In 1963, NBC TV came up with a hit show called My Favorite What? Martian. Now, the story was what you call a fish out of water story. That's where you take somebody from one place and you put him in another place that's completely different from where they ought to be. The person who was a fish out of story, or, or fish out of the, fish out of what? Fish out of the tank, fish out of water, 
was none other than The Martian, and he was played by Ray Walston. Um, there was that fish out of water, and there was also the protagonist. Now, a protagonist is the good guy. He's the person you relate to. He was played by Bill Bixby, who was a journalist named Tim O'Hara. The two came together because the Martian crashed his ship near where Tim O'Hara was, and Tim took him in, and the two of them hid who he was while he was fixing his ship, which for the next few years the show was on, he never managed to do. Now the thing about this Martian was he looked just like an ordinary guy. In fact, Tim kept telling people he was his uncle, Martin. But he was not an ordinary guy. He had an antenna that would come out of his ears, or just above his ears, and always to the sound of ooh, right? And he could read people's minds, and he could make things move by just moving his finger like this. So you have a protagonist, you have the fish out of water, and you also have this kind of sidekick who kind of knows what's going on, but doesn't know what's going on. And if I remember correctly with that show, which I haven't seen in years, it was Tim O'Hara's girlfriend, who kind of knew what was going on, but didn't quite know what was going on. And then you had the antagonist. Antagonists are usually hostile. In this case, she wasn't hostile. She was just clueless. It was his landlady who was forever walking in on things at the most uncomfortable moments. That was a hit show. NBC had a hit show, and ABC TV said, whoa, we could do that too. So the very next year, in 1964, they came out with the exact same story, only they changed a few things. This one was called Bewitched. You didn't know it was the same story, did you? It was. The fish out of water was Samantha Stevens. She was a witch in a world where there were not a lot of witches. She didn't move her finger like this. She moved her nose, and I can't imitate it. It would go, tinkle, tinkle, teak. And then things would happen. Now, the protagonist was her husband, Darren Stevens, who was this kind of hapless ad executive who just wanted to live an ordinary life, and he was trying to get Samantha to just hide her powers and keep them from everybody. He also had a clueless side, sidekick, his boss, Larry, who kind of knew something was strange, but didn't quite know what was going on. And then he had an antagonist. That was Mrs. Kravitz, who lived across the street, who was always in the window with binoculars, trying to see what was going on over there. She was married to the guy that later played the Maytag repairman, if you remember. So CBS was watching all this, and they said, boy, we got to get some of this ourselves. So they took the exact same story and created yet another show in 1965. It was called I Dream of Genie. Same exact thing. The fish out of water was Genie, played by Barbara Eden. She didn't go like this to make things move. She didn't go tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. She closed her, 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 her arms and went, oh, yo, 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 yo. Right? Now, the protagonist was Tony Nelson, played by Larry Hagman. He was an astronaut who just wanted to live an ordinary life and was forever trying to get Genie to stop doing her magic tricks. He had a clueless sidekick named Major Healy, who was played by the same guy who was later on the Bob Newhart show. I'm telling you, I'm, my mind is destroyed by television. And he had an antagonist, Dr. Bellows, who was always trying to figure out what was going on there. Now, all of them had hits, even though all of them were telling the exact same story again and again and again. Now, I want you to take that idea, and as usual, I want you to multiply it by a billion, and I want you to double up and multiply it by another 700 trillion, double it up again, and then go through the process again, and you might be coming close to what I'm actually talking about. Because stories are retold in the Bible again and again and again also. Sometimes they're the exact same story, it's only the context that changes. We're going to look today at Abraham and see how he plays into the Lamb of God that John is talking about. So, go with me to Genesis. Keep something in John. We will go back there before we're finished. Go to Genesis chapter 12. I'm not there myself. Genesis chapter 12. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here right at the beginning of the chapter. Now, Abram, Abram or Abraham, as his name would become, 
lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which is roughly what Iraq is today. There was no such thing as Israel at the time. There was no such thing as the Hebrews. He was the first Hebrew. And he was a Hebrew because God said he was a Hebrew and he brought forth the Jews from him. Here's where he tells him in verse 1 of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you. That land would ultimately be Israel. Verse 2, and I will make you a great nation, which would be Israel, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. Now, how has he been a blessing? Well, he brought forth Isaac, which we're going to talk about. And Isaac brought forth Jacob. And Jacob brought forth 12 sons who became the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses and Aaron and the priesthood came from Levi. David and Solomon and ultimately Jesus came from Judah. <coughs> they blessed the world with the very scriptures that we are now reading. And they further blessed the world by bringing us Jesus Christ in the flesh. All these promises were kept. But to Abraham, they must have seemed a little strange. You know, the great irony about Abram's name, does anybody know what it means? It means father. His wife was barren. By the time God called him, he was 75 years old. And Sarah was only a few years younger. These were not people who were expecting to have children. So when he thought about God bringing forth a nation from him, he thought, well, he must mean my servant. Go to chapter 15 and look at verse 2. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? In other words, he's thinking he'll be the heir. You can go through him. But don't you think if God meant Eleazar of Damascus was going to be the one through whom he'd bring a great nation that he would have talked to Eleazar of Damascus? He didn't, did he? He talked to Abraham. Verse 3, And Abraham said, Since you have given me no offspring, you've given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Now, he's an old man by this time. I think he's probably in his 80s. It is possible for men to father children. I had a great-grandfather who was about 80 when he fathered my grandfather. They can do that. Women generally are past the age of childbearing by the time they're in their 70s, at least. And they were thinking about this, and he looked at Sarah, and Sarah looked at herself, and they said, well, she wasn't having children when she was young. She's certainly not going to have any now, so let's find out something to do. And one of the things you will see over and over in scriptures is when man tries to help God out, he always makes a mess of things. They tried to help God out. They got Abram together with Hagar, who was young and beautiful, and they had a boy named Ishmael. And God blessed Ishmael. But not to go into a lot of detail, a lot of the trouble in the Middle East to this very day is rooted in that little act of bringing about Ishmael before bringing about Isaac. So in chapter 18, if you go there, just setting up context, chapter 18, verses 9 and 10. I only use this Bible for preaching, and I haven't been in Genesis in a while, and the pages don't want to turn. Verse 9. Then they said, and what they said is two angels and the Lord himself, Where is Sarah your wife? They were speaking to Abram. And he said, There in the tent. And he, meaning God, said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. You know how old Abram was by the time he had Isaac? He was 100 years old. Talk about a late life thing. And Sarah, I don't know the exact age, but she was in her 90s. Was this a miraculous birth? Tell, tell me like you mean it. Is that a miraculous birth? Could man do that? Only God could do that. Has that ever happened before, God bringing about somebody by a miraculous birth? Have we ever heard about that in the Christian church? Do we generally talk about it around Christmas time? Megan, are you up there? Did we get that first verse? See, I have to have my glasses off so I can't see her. They have to be on my head because Katie says I look like Hitler when I let my, my bangs go down. And if there's one thing a preacher doesn't want to do, he doesn't want to look like Hitler. 
right? So, here's the verses. Luke 1, 30 through 31, read it with me. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. You know the story. The angel appeared to Mary, but she's a virgin. Virgins don't have babies. And she asked about that. Next verses. Read it with me. But Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. One more verse there. When he heard about it, Matthew was suspicious. He heard that the Holy Spirit had made his wife pregnant. That doesn't usually happen, so he wondered, and God sent an angel to speak to him. It says here, read this with me again. But when he, Joseph, had thought this over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now go to chapter 22 of Genesis. We are ready for our story. Are you there? Verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And when I first started reading scriptures, and this once again talks to 60s television, I always heard these, these believers who God would call and they'd say, here I am. And it always sounded like Gomer Pot. Right? Here I am, Sergeant Carter, right? But you need to understand that in the Hebrew, this means so much more than here I am. God doesn't need to find out where they are. It means that they are bowing in absolute acquiescence to all of his will. They aren't simply saying, here I am. They are saying, here I am. When I was in Cambodia years ago, they taught me about the way people bow, and everybody bows there. They don't shake hands, they bow. There are three ways in which they bow. They either bow this way, they either bow this way, or they bow this way. Where you stand in, your, in their life is how high they will lift their hands. If they're speaking to their children who are beneath them, and I don't mean they don't care about them, they're subject to them, they bow this way. If you are an equal, they bow this way. If you are somebody way above them, they bow this way. What people are saying in Scripture when they say, here I am, is this. We need to understand that. Abraham's not helping God out here. He's acquiescing to whatever God would hand him. Verse 2. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Wow. Wow. And he's just gone through all of this. God has promised him that he's going to have a son. And through that son, he's going to bring a nation that is going to bless the whole wide world. Now he has the son. He's from Abraham, just like God said. He's from Sarah, just like God said. Most commentators feel he's probably in his late teens or early 20s now. This kid's got a lot of potential. And now the very God that gave him to him is saying, I want you to go sacrifice him. Take him to a mountain, I'm going to tell you. To, and... and Put him to death. Can we get a wow out of that? Um, once when I was uh, in my 20s, and this was well before I was a Christian, I used to hang out with a couple of guys, I'll just call them Jim and Jeff, and we drank a lot. We just sat around and drank beer. And when we ran out of beer, somebody would fly and somebody would buy and we'd get more beer. Well, my friend Jim at one point said, hey Vince, I'll fly and I'll buy if you'll ride with me. And I thought, wait, well, he likes my company. Well, so I went out with him and I realized the reason he wanted me with him was not because he liked my company, but because he had a motorcycle. And he needed somebody while he was driving to carry the beer. That was it. I, I had to hold on to him with both arms on the way to the liquor store. I could only hold on to him with one on the way back. And every time he'd take a corner, neither one of us was in good condition that street would start coming straight from my face and I would back away from it. You know what happened to the bike whenever I backed away from it? 
and threw it off balance. And he would have to correct himself in the street. We'd take another corner, the street start coming up my face. I would move away from it instinctively, which would throw us off balance. And finally he said, you know, Vince, you're gonna have to stop leaning away from me. You gotta start leaning with me or we're both gonna die. So I did it. I did the counterintuitive thing. I looked at that street coming towards my face and I leaned into the street. And everything went smoothly after that. Sometimes the safe thing, the right thing, is to do exactly the opposite of everything your instincts are telling you to do. God is not always gonna tell us to do something that makes sense. This couldn't have made sense. And yet in verse three, watch this. In verse three, we have Abraham responding. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place in which God had told him. Verse four. On the third day, Abram raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abram said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Now, I, wa I want you to understand he is not lying to them. They were going to worship. He was worshiping God by being obedient even in a moment when it didn't make any sense to him. Even when it broke his heart, he was being obedient to the Lord. Job, when he was suffering under the hand of the Lord, he said, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is worship. That's not to take anything away from music. We can worship with music, but music is not the full extent of worship. Worship is the life we live in worship with God, doing things sometimes that are absolutely crazy and terribly frightening for us. Amen? Amen. They were going to worship. Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, and that was a form of worship. Verses 7 and 8. Oh. Isaac spoke. Did I read 6? No. no. Verse 6. That's important too. Yes. Um, Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and took in his hand the fire and the knife and so the two of them walked together. Now a couple of things about this. First of all, Abram is over 100 years old, and Isaac is probably in his teens or his 20s. Who probably carried all that wood up the hill? I'm thinking Isaac, right? Did we ever have a son who was obedient to his father on his way to a sacrifice who carried his own wood on his back? That sounds familiar. It sounds like an old story. Can I get the next verse? Chapter 19 of John. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out. Read this with me. Carrying his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. It had happened before. Let's go on to verses 7 and 8. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Once again. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, for where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the what for the burnt offering? The lamb for the burnt offering. Verse 8. Abram said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Now hold on to that. We're going to go back to those verses a little bit later. But first let's look at 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now when I first started in ministry, I told you, I started with street evangelism. And I was with a group. They used to take meals out to the street. And we would preach the gospel from the back of the truck. And then we'd feed them. My job eventually just became I would preach a quick gospel. And then I would go out into the crowd and just kind of walk around trying to keep the peace. Because a lot of the people who came to those things were not people who were inclined to peace. There was a reason they were on the street. They would fight with each other over everything. And you were just there to walk up to people and to casually say, CJ, please be at peace. They weren't all peace called CJ, but I'm gonna throw you under the bus. Uh, <laughs> just keep, we're trying to keep the merchants happy. We don't want any trouble. If you guys could be at peace with one another and not fight with Doug, that would be good for all of us. And it was amazing, usually they agreed to it because they, they thought, you know, next week they'll be out to feed us too. We don't want to chase them off. And they would agree to it. 
Then the third thing that I would do along with others is I'd get, grab a trash bag and we'd pick up trash from all over the parking lot. Because they would drop their plates everywhere. And we all, the rule was make it look cleaner than it did before you got here. Don't just pick up our mess, pick up every mess. So I went to the van and I grabbed a bag and there was a man sitting in there crying his eyes out. He was a Native American man. Now the only reason I share his ethnicity is because that was important to him, as you'll see in the story. He saw me and I saw him and I looked at him and I grabbed the bag and went on my way. And I was off picking up trash and there was this red-headed kid, I never saw him before or after, who was about to get in a fight with somebody. And I started doing my usual thing. You need to be at peace. Let's be at peace. And he looked at me and says, what do you want me to do? These people insulted me. You want me to turn the other cheek? Well, no sooner did he say that than somebody slapped me upside the head. It wasn't him. It was an open palm. And I looked and there was that man I'd seen in the car. And he's shouting at me and says, so you don't want a red man in your car? And then he swatted me again. It was actually with his left hand. He swatted me on the right side of the head, head again. Now, three things I want you to, to know about this man that I can see. One, he was so drunk he could barely stand. Two, he had no right arm. He had only a left arm. And I don't remember what, oh, the third was he was emaciated. He was so thin that he looked like he was seldom ate. Um, but I felt led as he slapped me to do nothing. I, had, I didn't even remember that. I wasn't trying to teach a lesson to the redheaded guy. I just, you know sometimes how the spirit will give you peace in a moment that there ought not to be peace? I had peace. And I just stood there, I closed my eyes and he kept swatting me on the head three or four times. Hard. And I just took it. And each time he swatted me, he got more embarrassed about his own behavior. And eventually stopped and ran away crying. Now. I need to tell you something about my taking the swats that I was taking from him. I don't pretend to be a tough guy. I'm not Tony Soprano over here, right? But the guy was emaciated, he was drunk, and he only had one arm. I think I could have taken it, but I didn't. And it wound up embarrassing him. And what's more, the red-headed guy, when I remembered him at the end of it, was just standing there with his mouth wide open. Remember what he said just before that? What do you want me to do? Turn the other cheek? And I never saw him again, but I hope the Lord used that, because I think he used me as fodder in that story. Now, why am I telling that to you? Well, I'm telling it to you because sometimes faithfulness to the Lord requires us to give in in weakness to people that we are stronger than. Right? Isaac, again, was 17, maybe 20-some years old. Abraham was over a hundred years old by this time. If you were putting Las Vegas odds on who would win a battle between those two, all of your bets would certainly be on Isaac. So for Abraham to have tied him to the altar, Isaac had to have let him do it. You see what I'm saying? He didn't grab Isaac and Isaac fought and said, no dad, no dad, no. He did what he was told. He did his father's will. Have we ever heard that story before? Yes. Next verse, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, you can definitely read it with me, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Jesus didn't die on a cross because he couldn't get away. He walked through crowd after crowd after crowd. He went to a cross because he was being obedient to his father. Next verse. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Who sent him? Next verse, Matthew 26, 39, going on a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, and now read this with me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Isaac submitted to his father, just as Jesus would submit to his. Go to verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You ever really read that verse and thought about it as a parent? Wow. I remember 
I, we used to have to take our girls for shots when they were little. You remember that? And you knew it was coming and they didn't. You didn't dare tell them. <laughs> and I remember my daughter Libby, and I can use her because she, she isn't here. Um, <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> um, she was sitting in my lap and she had just asked me if she was going to get a shot. And I changed the subject. I knew she was going to get three. One right after the other in her thigh. And I was, I was already feeling like crying, and she didn't even know what was happening. And I wrapped my arms around her to hug her and to hold her legs, because I knew she had a lot of fight in her. And the nurse came and gave her one shot, and she started crying and looking at me with this look of betrayal. And then she gave her another one, and she looked a little angrily at me. And then the third, she looked at both the nurse and me, and she went, Wah! <laughs> So I held on to her continuously from that point on. That was difficult, but that was nothing compared to this. Abraham was being called on to kill his son. What was he thinking? Well, fortunately, we know what he was thinking. You know why? Because the Spirit has told us. He told the Spirit of the, he told the writer of the book of Hebrews. Can I get the next verses? Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. It says, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now watch this. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he received Isaac back from death. What was Abraham thinking? He was thinking, God made a promise that my son was going to bring forth a nation of people, and there's nothing I can do to end that. You want to talk about worship. And he's saying, God can raise the dead. After I kill him, God will raise him from the dead. Did anybody ever raise their son from the dead before? I don't have a verse for that. <laughs> Genesis 22, verses 11 through 12. But the angel to the Lord, of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now I want you to understand that God did not need to do this in order to know what was in Abraham's heart. God uses what's called anthropomorphisms. He explains us things to us that make sense to our human minds. He didn't have to find out what was in Abraham's mind. He knew what was in Abraham's mind before Abraham ever had it in his mind. Look at Psalm 139, if you would. David writes this next verse. Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, and when I get up, you understand my thoughts from far away. You scrutinize my path. And my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. I read these verses when I was a new Christian, and just before I was doing that, I was practicing my prayers before I went to God. And it suddenly dawned on me, he hears me practicing. I might as well wing it, right? <laughs> when nothing is hidden from God. Next verse. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. How many creatures? None. No creature hidden from the sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. None of this stuff was hidden from God. He already knew how Abraham would react. You know why he did all of this? I believe he did it to give us a picture of Jesus Christ. He did it because Jesus is all over this passage. Go back to verses 7. You're right. Oh, well, did I read 13? Did I read 13? No. no, okay, hold on. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Now, what did he offer in his place? A ram. The Los Angeles football team is called the what? Rams. The Rams. It was a ram. But do you remember what he said in verses 7 through 8? I said we're going to go back there. Go back there. 7 through 8. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. 
And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? The what? The lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the what? The lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Well, what was supplied to him? Was it a lamb or a ram? It was a ram. That's why I did the Los Angeles Rams thing. Because they run, and I want you to confuse them. Right? He gave him a ram. So was Abraham prophesying or not? Yes, he was prophesying. Go back to John. Where we see the lamb that God has supplied. Chapter 1 of John. Verse 35 and 36. Again on the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the what? The what? The what? The Lamb of God. The true disciple. Oh, I'm going too far. Behold the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of the sacrifice that God would supply. He did supply that Lamb of the sacrifice. He did bring it just as he had promised. Let me give you something else that's interesting. You remember the mount that they were on when he tried to offer Isaac? Mount more Moriah. There are three mounts right around where Jerusalem is. There's the Mount of Olives, there's Mount Zion, and there's Mount Moriah. Katie and I have been to Mount Moriah. We've been to all three of them, actually. When we've been to Mount Moriah, there are a couple of sites that uh, are recognized in different churches as to where Jesus died on the cross. The Catholic Church has one site, which is indoors, and you go and see it at a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a shrine. Uh, it wasn't indoors then, they're not claiming that, but you go and see it at a shrine. But a much more promising version is a place called the Garden Tomb, which is on Mount Moriah. It is, it's on Mount Moriah. Um, the garden tomb is just down the hill about a half a block from this big rock quarry. Can you show the rock quarry? Do we have it there, Megan? I don't know if you can see it. Do you see a skull in there? Can you see the skull? The eyes? What was Golgotha called? Oh, the place of the skull. That skull is still, I believe that is the place. I believe that skull is still there. They say that they used to sacrifice there. I mean, they used to crucify there 2,000 years ago. And because there is a, a grave just of a rich man, they know because of the cistern and everything just down the hill, it's a very promising site as to where Jesus was killed. Now, it's in Palestinian territory. And they don't like us sitting there staring at it because in Palestinian or Muslim theology, Jesus doesn't die on a cross for sin. Nobody dies on a cross for sin in Muslim theology. They're offended by somebody dying on a cross. For... So they would scream at us and yell at us and honk at us and tell us to stop looking, that Jesus was never there, blah, blah, blah. And we asked, well, why don't they just destroy it then? They hate it when tourists watch it. Well, it turns out, I think you can see them, there are Muslim graves on top of that hill. Guess what they can't touch? Muslim graves on top of that hill. I don't know about you, but for me, it almost seems sovereign. They, they don't get to destroy this. Now what's especially interesting, and I'm going to end with this, is that if you stand looking at that place where the cross may have been, and you look to your right, you can see the Temple Mount. You can see it over on Mount Zion. And if you were up on a cross, I didn't try it. <laughs> uh, they didn't offer it, and I wouldn't have taken it anyway. And if you were to look over to your right, you would have seen all these people walking on the Temple Mount. If Jesus died there, he died at the temple in full view of his eyes. Which makes a certain passage in Isaiah 65, if you would go there, especially interesting. Now, I don't know, but here's what it says in Isaiah 65 too. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Is Jesus spreading out his hand all the day long to a disobedient people in that very place on Mount Moriah? And was Mount Moriah the same place where Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice? I think that possibility is theirs. But all I can do is report, and you decide. Let's pray. Lord, I praise you for all the stories that are in your word. 
because we are know we know they are not just tales. And within those stories are stories and more stories, and all those stories tell the one story of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that one story is the reason for living. That story is the one thing that keeps us living forever. And we praise you for all of us in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said,
would love us enough to send your one and only son, the perfect lamb of God. Who would have thought that a lamb could save the souls of men? Thank you so much, Father, for this gift. And thank you, Lord, for the, for the stories throughout your word that we can see time and time again, God, that you are faithful, that you provide, Lord, that you love us. Father, help us to recognize your love, Lord. Help us, Father, to live it, to worship you, not just in song, not just in church, God. As I saw a son yesterday, God, that said, you want soul custody, not just weekend visits. God, help us, Lord, to give you soul custody of our hearts, of our minds, Lord. Father, help us to represent you in this world because this world needs you. Father, I pray that you will put it on our hearts to minister, Lord, to reach out, God, to love people the way that we should. And if there is something standing in our way and holding us back, God, if it's our pride, if it's our shame, if it's our feeling of unworthiness, God, Help us remember who you are and who we are because of you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your faithfulness. Please, Lord, be with us as we leave this place. Walk with us, Lord, out those doors. God, keep us safe. Keep us well. We bring it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The greatest story ever told was told by the Lord. And he's told that story again and again in Scripture. And here's the most amazing thing. He's still telling it. He is the author of the story as it's even being told in every life in this room. Let us be proclaimers of that story. And let everybody see within our own stories that story behind it of Jesus Christ on a cross. Of Jesus Christ in a grave. Of Jesus Christ rising from the dead and bringing all who believe in him to new life. Because as my sister just said, we live in a world that desperately needs it. And we are his body. His spirit is present within us. Pray that he will tell his story through us this very week. And go in God's peace and go in God's power. Amen. Amen.